All right, well, our current series is titled Ready for Battle. The Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians tells us we are involved in a spiritual battle. One of the most important things to have in a battle is proper intelligence. You want to know who your enemy is and what his plans are. If you know that the enemy is going to attack at a certain place at a certain time, you can be ready and stand a better chance of surviving the attack. Unfortunately, you don't always know when and where they're going to strike. So you need to be ready at all times. The enemy likes to strike when we're not prepared. So Paul tells us that we should be prepared at all times. Paul says that part of being prepared and surviving an attack from the enemy is to make sure that we always have our armor on. If we start feeling safe and put our armor aside, even for a moment, we're easy targets. So read with me again Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 to 17. This is our theme, theme scripture for this whole series that we're doing. It says, therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Last week, we looked at the belt of truth and learned what it is. If you weren't here last week, you may want to go back and watch it online or request a copy of the CD or the DVD so you can catch up with us. But we learned about the belt of truth and why that is the first piece we put on. We learned that it is actually the most important piece because it holds all the rest of the armor together. Without the belt of truth, you can't really wear the rest of the armor. Today, we're going to look at the breastplate of righteousness. But first... I want you to take a close look at that list of things. If you have your Bibles open, maybe they can just go back and toggle between, between those parts on the screen there in, the, in, in, in those scriptures. Look at the armor that Paul mentions. I want you to notice that all the pieces that he mentions, none of them are designed to protect the back. He lists the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes, the helmet. There's no protection for the back. Now, some people logically assume that the breastplate would include a back piece. When you look at our, our sample of the soldier up here, this is not the type of armor that Paul was talking about. This armor, if you've ever been to a museum or something where you've actually seen one, it completely surrounds the, the knight or whatever would be wearing that armor. It's complete, he's completely protected from the front and the back. The Roman uh, armor that Paul was describing typically did not have a back piece. I know sometimes you see those in Christmas or Easter productions or something, but the regular Roman soldier did not have a back piece to his breastplate. There were several reasons for that. Number one, the basic armor was provided by the Roman government, and they were cheap. That was the most expensive part of the armor to produce, the breastplate and the back piece that went with it. They were very expensive, and they said, we're not going to provide that. If you want that, you can pay for that yourself. So some of the soldiers did save up money and purchase that, but on a, on a beginning soldier's salary, it took a long time to save up to even purchase that if they were going to purchase that part of the armor. Secondly, retreat was not part of the Roman vocabulary. They were trained to fight until death. A Roman soldier was expected never to turn his back on the enemy. And if his back was never to the enemy, why would he need back protection? If you put protection on the back, it encourages you to turn. They didn't want them turning. They wanted them advancing. And that's one of the things we're going to be learning through this series. I already talked about it a couple of times. The purpose of the armor that God gives us is not so that we can just stand there and say, okay, devil, Bring it on. I'm ready for you. It's so we can actually go and become a weapon and go on the offensive and attack. It's to turn us into a weapon. They were trained to advance, to march, to fight. They were trained never retreat. It's better for you to die in battle, kind of like the kamikaze pilots in World War II. They're willing to die for the cause. They are not turning away. They are fighting until death. But it was the most advanced army at that time, they were very successful in their campaigns. That's why they were able to take over most of the known world at that time. Because the armor they had, the weaponry they had, the training they had, it was sophisticated. And they were trained to win. They were not trained to lose. It was also expected 
that a soldier would co concentrate on what was in front of him. Soldiers behind him would protect his back. They marched in formation. They would have lines of soldiers, and the first line would advance. They would be attacking. If one of them did happen to follow, another one would step in and take his place and keep on going. The soldiers behind would protect the backs of those in front. They didn't need back protection because somebody else was protecting their back. Only commanders were issued back protection by the government because the commanders stood behind everybody else. They were susceptible to an attack from the back, so the Romans would give them back protection. The regular soldiers didn't have it. So as I was meditating on those thoughts, reading about that on the armor and how there was nothing to protect the back and each person was supposed to protect the back of the person in front of them, several spiritual applications came to mind. Number one, as soldiers in God's army, we should face our enemy head on and never run. Our job is not to run, not to be afraid of the devil and run and please leave me alone. Our job is to say, come on, devil, I'm after you. You better start running. Use the name of Jesus. And at the name of Jesus, demons have to flee. Just like the Roman government gave a soldier everything they needed to be successful, God has given us everything that we need. If we're proper, properly wearing the armor and properly using the weapons that God gave us, we cannot lose. We are guaranteed a victory. We will be victorious. But as Paul said at the beginning of this passage, we need to stand. We need to take a stand against the enemy. We need to be willing to fight. We've given what we need, but we have to choose to wear the armor and to fight. The second thing that I think can give us a spiritual application here is it's our responsibility to protect the backs of others that are fighting next to us or fighting in front of us. We are all one force. We're not, Paul said, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. We're not fighting against each other. Our job is to protect the other soldiers that are standing beside us or standing in front of us. And I got to thinking, how many times do we as Christians actually stab our fellow soldiers in the back? Instead of protecting their back, we're the ones thrusting the sword into their back by criticizing them or, 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 or something. Our job is to protect each other, not to stand as an, individ an individual and watch others fall. We help them stand by protecting their backs. So with that in mind, Let's take a look at what the breastplate of righteousness is and see how it applies to our spiritual battle. The first thing to note is what the breastplate did. The breastplate protected the vital organs of the body. If any of those organs were compromised, it would mean almost certain death to the soldier. Depending on which organ was penetrated, could be instant death, might be a little bit slower death. But if any of those organs were penetrated by the enemy, it would mean almost certain death. So the breastplate was very important. It protected the vital organs. The most important and most vulnerable of those organs was the heart. If a sword, spear, or arrow were to penetrate the heart, the soldier would die within minutes. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says, Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. Of course, Proverbs is not talking about our physical heart that pumps blood. It's talking about our spiritual heart. But above all else, we need to guard our heart. Just as our physical heart is important to our life, we cannot live unless that physical heart is operating. We cannot live spiritually unless our spiritual heart is functioning properly. We need to guard our heart. We need to protect the heart. What it's saying here is if the heart stops... You stop. That's true in the physical sense, but it's also true in the spiritual sense. When the Bible talks about the heart, it's usually not referring to the physical organ that pumps blood. It's instead talking about who we really are on the inside. The heart is a combination of our mind, our will, and our emotions. These three things are actually what control our actions and our words. Luke chapter 6, verse 45, Jesus said, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. You want to find out what's in somebody's heart? 
Listen to them for a short time. You'll figure out what's in their heart. That passage we just read in Luke talks about good and evil. Synonyms for good and evil are righteousness and sin. Jesus said the reason we sin is because we have sin stored up in our hearts. In the same manner, when we're righteous, it's because we have righteousness stored up in our hearts. So I guess I need to stop here and explain what righteousness is. The simple definition of righteousness is right doing or right deeds. Righteousness simply means doing the right thing. That's how simple it is. Righteousness, doing the right thing. And how do we do the right things? By having the right things on the inside. That's what Jesus said. It's what's on the inside that comes out. So we need to protect our hearts, not let the bad stuff come in. Because if the wrong stuff comes in, it will destroy our heart. And the wrong stuff will start coming out. So if righteousness is actually actions, why does Paul say we need a shield of righteousness? Or a breastplate of righteousness, excuse me, or shield, shield of faith. It goes back to the verse we read in Luke. Our enemy, the devil, is constantly firing arrows of sin, of evil or sin at us. He's trying to penetrate our heart because he knows that if our heart is filled with evil, it will kill us spiritually. If we're not wearing the breastplate of righteousness, those arrows will penetrate our heart. In a couple of weeks, we're going to talk about the shield of faith. Essentially, the breastplate is a shield for the heart. A regular shield can be moved from place to place to block an incoming object. It can protect us from overhead. It can protect us from the side. It can be moved where it needs to be moved. The breastplate is a shield, but it stays in place and guards the most vulnerable part. You can't get through this as long as I'm wearing it. My heart is protected. If the breastplate is not securely fastened, evil can penetrate and easily destroy us. In the spiritual sense, the breastplate acts more like a filter. A real breastplate would keep everything out. Our breastplate of righteousness allows the good things to enter while blocking the evil and keeping it out. Now, even though the illustration of the breastplate is referring to the heart, remember what I said about the spiritual heart being a combination of the thoughts, will, and emotions. The breastplate of righteousness Righteousness is not actually something that we wear on our chest. You can't see it. It's something that keeps all evil from entering our minds, which will affect our will and our emotions. There are really only two places where things can enter our minds. That's through our eyes and through our ears. The breastplate of righteousness, if properly worn, protects our eyes and our ears and keeps evil thoughts and desires from getting in to our spiritual heart, because our spiritual heart is really not here. Paul's just using the illustration, the armor, to help them understand. It's our spiritual heart, which things enter there from the eyes and ears. It's not something that happens automatically. Paul says we need to consciously put it on. Just like the Roman soldier was issued a breastplate when he enlisted, we are given righteousness when we accept Christ. Christ says, okay, you accept me. Here's my righteousness Put it on. We have to choose to put the breastplate on. Last week when we talked about the belt of truth, we learned the belt, that the belt is Jesus. And that the belt is what holds the other pieces of the armor together. If we believe that Jesus is the truth and that his words are the truth, then we need to start living by that truth. If I believe what Jesus said is true, if I believe this word, that this is true, then what the breastplate is, is simply taking what I've claimed to believe is true and applying it to my life. Doing it. It stands on the truth. I first accept the truth, but now because I know it's truth, I will live by the truth. I will do the truth. I will walk in righteousness. If Jesus says we should do it, we do it. If he says we shouldn't do it, we don't. Everything we need to know about righteousness is already given to us when we accept Christ. Because when we accept Christ, we accept the whole thing. We have it. Now we have to choose to put it on. Because we're wearing the truth, we fasten the breastplate securely to the truth, and we begin to write and write, walk in righteousness. We begin to evaluate everything according to the truth that we have already been given by Jesus. 
Knowing the truth should lead to righteousness. But true righteousness is acting upon the truth that we claim to believe. In the Old Testament, God gave the people some rules to follow. Those rules were true because they came from God. However, God didn't force them to obey the rules. He said, these are the rules. This is what I want you to do. But they had to choose whether or not they were going to follow those rules or not. God said, if you obey these commands I have given you, you will have my blessing. And you will have my protection. But if you don't follow my instructions, then my protection and my blessing will not be with you. In other words, he said, here, I'm giving you the breastplate of righteousness. I'm telling you how to walk. Here it is. Choose to put it on. Choose to follow my commands. You will be protected. But choose to disobey. It's like putting our breastplate aside. Now you're open to attack. I cannot protect you if you're not wearing me, if you're not walking in the truth that I've given you. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 24 through 25, Moses said, The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God so that we might always prosper and be kept alive, as is the case today. And if we are careful to obey all this law before the Lord our God as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. What did Moses say the righteousness would be? He said, obeying the laws or decrees. He said, if we obey these things, that will be our righteousness. Obeying the truth is righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness protects our hearts and keeps us alive spiritually. All throughout the Old Testament, we see stories of what happened when the nation of Israel were walking in righteousness and what happened when they didn't walk in righteousness. When they were obeying God's decrees, they had his blessings and protection. But when they disobeyed and laid their righteousness aside, they were taken over by other nations. Some people think, so what's the big deal? If I want to disobey, it's nobody's business but my own. If I want to take a risk with my own life, why should anybody else care? Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Things might affect us personally first, but we're all in this together. The the army, it wasn't just one person supposed to wear the uniform. They were all supposed to wear the uniform because you're only as strong as the weakest link, right? They're supposed to work together. It might affect us first, but when you die, it affects the others around you because now they've got to jump in and take your spot. They've got to fill in for you. We're in it together. In some way, our sin eventually will affect other people. We're the first ones to be affected by it. But it will affect other people. In the book of Joshua, we read the story of Achan. The Israelites had just scored a major victory over the city of Jericho, where not one Israeli life was lost. But when they went against the small city of Ai, which should have been an easy win, they were defeated badly. And many Israelis lost their life in that battle. The reason they lost was because one man, Achan, had chosen to disobey God. It wasn't the whole nation. One man chose to disobey God by taking some things that were supposed to be dedicated to to God, given to the priest for use in the tabernacle. It was only one man. But because the one man chose not to wear his breastplate of righteousness, it affected his whole family and the whole nation of Israel. We cannot sin without without it affecting our family, without it affecting our friends, without it affecting others. It will affect all of us. That's why we need to have the back of other people. We need to help lift them up. Say, no, you need to put that breastplate back on. Don't allow the breastplate to put aside because if you die, it's going to affect all of us. We need to be looking out for others, helping encourage them to stay in the battle and to wear the armor Let me quickly give you some other scriptures that talk about righteousness and how it protects us. Psalms 31.1 says, In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Says it's his righteousness. But we have to put the righteousness on. Psalms 119.40 How I long for your precepts. In your righteousness... Preserve 
my life. A precept is a principle or a law or a rule. That's what a precept is. I long for your laws. I long for your rules because your rules teach me how to live righteously. And if I follow your rules, then my life will be preserved. That's what it's saying there. Both those scriptures we just read talk about God's righteousness. The righteousness comes from God. It's his righteousness, but it's given to us to wear. When we accept Christ, we get his righteousness through faith. But he doesn't force us to wear the righteousness. He says, here it is. I've given you everything. Will you now walk in it? Will you do it? Romans chapter 3, verse 22. Paul says, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. We are given it through Jesus. When we believe in Jesus, we are given the righteousness. Job said, in Job 29, 14, I put on righteousness as my clothing. Justice was my robe and my turban. He said, I put it on. I choose to wear it. That's what Paul's saying. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. You must decide, I am going to wear this. I am going to walk in the truth that I claim to know. I am going to act according to that truth. Here's a couple more scriptures. Proverbs 13, 6. Righteousness guards the person of integrity, but wickedness overthrows the sinner. Romans chapter 6, verse 13. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought, brought from death to life. And offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Offer every part as an instrument to righteousness. When we accept Christ through faith, we choose to put on the belt of truth. Part of putting on the belt is agreeing that everything Jesus says is true and committing to live our lives according to the truth as declared in his word. Once we have the belt of truth, the next step is to securely fasten the breastplate of righteousness to that belt. The belt by itself can't protect us. We need the breastplate to be attached to the belt to give us the protection for our hearts. Now, let me explain how this works in the real world. You say, that's all great, but how does it really work? Let me just give you a few examples. Let's say I'm tempted to do something dishonest. Maybe it's cheating on a test in school for you, the students here. You know, I, I, I don't know if I've studied correctly, but I know the student next to me, they, they, they're probably going to get it right. I, I can just look in their paper, and I, I, I can write down the end, and I'll get an A, and my mom will be happy, my teacher will be happy, I can graduate, whatever it may be. We're tempted to cheat. Or... For us older ones, maybe we're cheated to fudge a little bit on our income taxes, not declare a little bit of money that came in, and who's going to know? It's not going to hurt anybody. Does the government really need my money anyway? They're going to waste it. I'd rather save it so I'd give it to the church, right? Because that's why people cheat on their taxes, because they want to give more to the church, not have the government have it all. I'm tempted to tell a small lie, because it's going to help me get that advancement at work, or maybe going to help me get the job. You know, the thing I hate about job resumes is they almost encourage you to lie, you're supposed to claim that you've done stuff you haven't done to look better so you can get that job. You're starting out on the wrong foot. Tell the truth. Let your job stand or fall based on the truth. But I, I can tell a small lie that's either going to keep me out of trouble because I really did this, but it's really not that bad. If I admit to it, I could lose my job. So I'll just deny that I did it, and then I can keep my job. We're tempted to tell a small lie. We're tempted to do something in some way to lie or be dishonest. What does the belt of truth say? The belt of truth says, Proverbs 10, 2, ill-gotten treasures have no last, lasting value. An A on a test that we didn't earn honestly has no lasting value. We didn't really learn it. We got that little, the A, got that little red or gold star on top of our paper, but it doesn't help us. It has no lasting value. But righteousness delivers from death. The belt of truth also says, don't tell a lie. Because I know the truth, 
I make sure that my breastplate of righteousness is fastened securely in place. Instead of giving into the temptation and cheating or lying, I say, no, I will not do that because the Bible says no. Jesus says that's not correct. I will put my breastplate on. I will resist that. I will not give into that. I will do the right thing because I believe the truth that Jesus declared in his word. Let's say I'm a single person. I'm not, but let's say I am. I'm a single person looking for someone to marry, and I find a very attractive, financially secure person that all my friends say would make a great spouse. The only problem is they're not a believer. What does the belt of truth say? 2 Corinthians 6.14. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? It says, don't do it. It doesn't say, marry them and maybe you, they'll come to Christ through you. It does say if we're already married to somebody who's not a believer, that, the only way that should happen is if two unbelievers get married and then one of them becomes a believer. Then it says you should stay with that person because maybe you can win them. But it says don't marry somebody what we call missionary marriages. I'm going to marry them because maybe if I marry them, then they'll become a Christian. The Bible, that does occasionally work. Very seldom does it work. The Bible says do not be unequally yoked. You know the best way not to be unequally yoked? Don't date them in the first place. Say, well, I'm just going to date them. Just, well, we'll, we'll never get married. I'll just date them. But we, don't date, and you'll never worry about being unequally yoked. Just say, you know what? I'm waiting for the right one. God says this is not the right one because they are not, they don't believe the same way I do. They don't share the same Savior that I do. So I know what it says, and I know I'm stepping on some toes here. Some of you guys don't want to listen to this. I'm telling you what this says. Do you believe in Jesus or not? Do you believe that what he says is true? It doesn't mean we like what he says. But if we really believe this is truth, we begin to act upon that truth. We say, I believe it. I may not agree with it. I may not understand it. But that's what he said. I believe Jesus. I choose to walk in righteousness. I choose to walk according to his word. Regardless of what other people may be counseling me. You know what? They're rich. You never have to work. They can take care of you. Everybody will be jealous because you'll have the most attractive spouse in the world. Who cares? The Bible says, don't do it. Let's say there's a new movie in the theater or maybe it's on TV. Everybody says it's the best movie to come out this year. Should I go see it because everybody says it's so good? Well, that depends. What does the belt of truth say? The belt of truth, Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things. So regardless of what the movie critics or my friends may say about the movie, I make sure it passes the righteousness test. I evaluate it based on Philippians 4.8. Is it true? Is it noble? Is it right? Is it lovely? Is it admirable? I make sure my breastplate of righteousness in play, is in place. And if the movie doesn't pass the Jesus filter, if I wouldn't take Jesus to see it, then I probably shouldn't go see it by myself. Because if I do, knowing that Jesus wouldn't sit through it, if I go, it's like taking my breastplate off and setting it aside. And when I set my breastplate aside, I'm a sitting duck for the enemy. If we're wearing the breastplate of righteousness, it protects us from the enemy's arrows of adultery. Even adultery of the heart. Because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 28, I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart. Job, knowing that, even though Jesus hadn't been born yet, in chapter 31, verse 1, Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes never to look lustfully at a young woman. 
The truth says, don't even look. Doesn't say you can't look at a woman. It says, don't look lustfully. And you can all figure out the difference there. If you're struggling with that, do you really believe the truth? Have you really accepted Jesus? How are you going to put the breastplate on to make sure you live for that? And I know every once in a while I bring this up. We've got, we've got a wonderful software we can help you set up on all your devices, on your, on your computers, on your phones, on every device you have. Several people in the church have it. It's called Covenant Eyes. And it will help you keep from doing that. Maybe you've been struggling. You've been trying to overcome it on your own. You can't do it. It's not working. You need extra help. Talk to me. We'll help you get set up with that. If you believe the truth, you need to wear the breastplate. You need to do whatever's necessary to protect yourself. And this applies to men and women both, okay? Some women struggle with pornography. Talk to us. Get help. Put something on to keep that evil out. Because if that evil enters, it will destroy you. Simply knowing the truth and claiming to believe the truth is not good enough. The belt of truth is the first piece of the armor we put on. But if we don't also put on the breastplate of righteousness, we're still in jeopardy. James chapter 2 verse 14 says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? And then we jump down a couple more verses to verse 17. James says, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. We claim to believe Jesus. We claim to believe that this is his word, that everything in this word is truth. Do we believe it or not? If we really believe it, if we have the truth, then we need to go the next step and say, I'm putting the breastplate on. I'm living my life based on the truth that I claim to believe. To simply say I believe it and not follow through on it does us no good. When we accept Christ, we're given the breastplate. Righteousness comes from God. The definition of righteousness, as I've already said, is literally just doing the right thing. You know, we think it's some way out there thing. No, it's not. Righteousness is simple. Righteousness is doing the right thing thing. How do we know what's right? It tells us right here. We learn this. We do what it says. We don't do what it says not to do. The right thing according to who? Me? My friends? Society? Doing the right thing according to God. He is the truth. So we do the right thing based on that truth. When we wear the breastplate, we have all the protection we need. But when we choose to set the breastplate aside, the enemy can easily destroy us. We have to make a conscious effort to wear our breastplate at all times. If we take it off for even a moment, we're in jeopardy. If a police officer knows that he's going into a situation where there's an active shooter, he wouldn't think of putting himself in that situation without his bulletproof vest. But most officers wear their vests even when there's no apparent danger because danger is always lurking. You don't always know when it's going to just pop up. They could just stop somebody for a routine traffic stop. Somebody's got an expired license tab, and they pull them over, and as they approach the car, somebody rolls down the window and points a gun at them and fires a couple of rounds. Can you imagine a police officer? Wait, 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 wait. Don't shoot yet. Don't shoot yet. Let me, go get my, go, let me go get my vest. And the shooter waiting for them to go back and get the vest on and come back. Okay, now I'm ready for you. Fire away. It doesn't work that way. We can't say, I'm going to wait until I need it. Then I'm going to put on the righteousness. We need to have the righteousness on at all times. I will wear this. I will stand on the truth. I will live by God's word at all times. With the vest the police officers protected. Without it, they're dead. The same is true of our spiritual walk. The enemy is always looking for a way to destroy us. We might not feel like we're in an active war zone at this time, but the enemy could be lurking behind the bushes or just over the next ridge. It's too late when we're confronted to put on the breastplate. It needs to be fastened securely at all times. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14, once again says, Stand firm then, 
with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, and with the breastplate of righteousness in place. Because I believe the truth, I will make sure I'm walking in that truth. I don't have to like it. I don't even have to agree with it because I don't understand it. And it's hard to agree with something you don't understand. But because it came from Jesus, I'm going to walk in it even if I don't understand it. Even if I don't right now agree with it because my human intellect won't let me agree with it. I'm going to trust that Jesus knows what's best for me. And I will choose to follow his commands. Do it his way. Because when I do it his way, I'm protected. When I don't do it his way, I'm dead spiritually. It may not lead immediately to spiritual death, but it will lead to death if we leave ourselves open 